going to bring our voices in here. I want to do a little check as we ramp up for Thursday. Just a little pre-stream, pre-funk. Robert Emerson says, seems like an intense montage. Yeah, this is how Owen and I prepare for the show. We uh, put on some montage music and we get real intense about it. Um, but do let me know if you can hear us. Yeah. Yeah, we don't allow it. Do Duke, you made it in time. That is true. Troy is loud and clear. That means you are not hearing an Owen. He's singing a beautiful song right now, and I'm really, uh, I'm really bummed um, to hear that because he's he's really putting his all into it. It's really, it's kind of moving. It's a very touching song that he's singing. It's called "If I Were a Thursdayage." Oh, and I'm gonna. Be oh, go ahead. You do, that's true. I'm gonna hit a button and you're gonna be like, I hear my voice, I think. Would you give it a test? Okay, let's see what the world says. Hey, Jason Waltman, good to see you. Brian F. Irving's here. Jonesy says I sound good, thank you. Um, Owen, hi. Let's see. Is Owen squeaking? <laughs> that might be me. Hey, Jason. Yeah, um, we're just kind of we're kind of hanging out, getting ready to roll. You hear a Troy? Good. Ren's here. Our friend, our pal. Yeah, they don't hear you. How about this? Oops. Well, let's try. Yeah, well, I bet we'll end up hearing. Um, I bet they'll say, I hear you. Soft Squatch. <laughs> oh, like the actual. I thought you said, like, Soft Squatch. <laughs> <laughs> right? I can tell you can hear your voice. Must be a little rattling. <laughs> I know I can hear it in your voice. Uh, no Owen yet, friends of mine. Pal o mine. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna now we're gonna just gonna do this. This is what we're gonna do for the rest of our lives. Uh, let me double check one more thing. Uh, oh, and say something for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Stan. Oh, I know this. Um, An embiggen, an embiggen of Sasquatches. An embiggen. Do, 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 do. Say something for me, my friend. I'm trying to figure out what the collective noun for Sasquatch is. I'm currently going with embiggen, an embiggen of Sasquatches. Uh, apparently, it has been suggested. Let's see, there's no accepted collective noun. Uh, some people have suggested a conundrum of Sasquatches, uh, a convocation, a syndicate of Sasquatches. I like Ooh. embiggen better. I like an embiggen of Sasquatches. I do too. I, I do the, too. I think that's the right to go with that. Um, good news, my friend. 
they oh, can, can hear you. Can hear me now? Yes. All right. So the whole point was the reason I'm talking about Sasquatch is that I said, if you can hear me, type in Sasquatch. So, or if you prefer Skunk Ape. So hopefully we are about to see a wave of people typing in Sasquatch and that way we'll know they actually hear me and not my evil duplicate who does not know a wild Owen appears says Stephen Jones. Yes. That's, that's, that's pretty convincing. I think they I would be everybody's like kerf- a kerfuffle of Sasquatch. Yes. Air. I like Air. that. Okay. Skunk ape. I thought he said soft squatch, which I wasn't sure what that was. I thought it was like a, just a real mellow game of like, you know, a uh, hopscotch or something. Um, well, you know how there's there's softball and and then eventually you get baseball or softball for for women's leagues, for example. Yeah. So soft squash is is like uh, squash, but <laughs> sure, softball. sure, yeah, yeah, just like a kind of a more mellower, you know. Um, I don't know. Women's softball is not necessarily mellower. No, absolutely not. Nuh-uh. No, women's softball is a a full on sport. I've been beamed with one of those things. I I think softball is a terrible misnomer it is indeed um softer ball might be accurate but jason waltman says you know hunting bigfoot is big in oklahoma um so in in both oklahoma and arkansas we've got skunk apes which are slightly more common um i i don't know how common actual sasquatch efforts are but a krypton (laughs) we've had dragon hunting advertising go in the the local uh newspapers um and uh, Daleks have been spotted. So oh. these, these things happen. Well, I want to tell you this. I have a friend who is very much into hunting for Sasquatch. Uh, goes out into the wild, covers himself with uh, deer urine, and hangs out in the bushes, um, hoping to see the, the great... Well, what if Sasquatches don't like deer? You know, right. I mean, I, who's to presume that? I mean, I guess there's part of the part of the whole mystique is that there's an aroma of a very strong aroma of urine. So, um, I mean, one would presume maybe that the skunk ape is not the most um, hygienic. I mean, by our standards, well, skunk apes are 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 supposedly actively stenchy, but you know. So are gamers at Gen Con half the time. True I be that. that no, I mean, just don't hold them against me because um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a pungent um, aroma, especially by like the fourth day and not everybody, just a particular, maybe a younger set. I, I got to say, if someone before the stream had told me uh, that we're going to be discussing Troy's friends who cover themselves in urine, uh, you know what? I would not have been. I wouldn't have been as surprised, maybe as I should have been. But Stan writes, "Are you certain the whole Sasquatch thing isn't just a cover for how much he enjoys the deer urine?" Um, yeah, I don't know that anyone enjoys deer urine. I mean, other than other deer, possibly German deer, mostly. Um, you know what? Let's move on to a different topic. Let's let's, let's so, move off the deer sadly, topic. Um, I have ceased to hear what you are uh, saying, but not. How about from cities? lack of want, um, I'm what I'm gonna do and sewer is, systems. Hey, that's sort of a. a I can a, see you talking. Um, what I'm gonna um, have you do, my dear dear friend, is uh, yep. Now I can't hear Troy. Describe the day. I don't know if anyone else can hear Troy. Uh, I got an LOL from Stan, so people are hearing me. So yeah, let's let's talk about <laughs> cities. That's what we're here for. And then when I hear Troy again, I'll let you all know. And if you can hear him, uh, you know, type some other cryptic in there we'll, we'll pick one <sighs> sewer alligator since we're talking about sewers um <clears throat> so uh but neither of you can hear the other but we hear you both okay no i can't hear troy and apparently troy can't hear me but everyone else can hear us great so we're probably a jumbled mess talking over each other i i, I thought we had this one worked out folks i'm sorry and i don't know if i should keep talking or not they can't hear each other oh that's just great that's awesome i'm gonna go back to sitting fiddler on the roof pastiches at this point i cannot hear troy so i don't know when he's talking so i don't know if i'm talking over him all right now i'm told that troy's troy's dropped out and now i should keep talking all right um I don't know if I should start the subject or not, though. So maybe I should tell a story. Uh, hey, LJ, what's the top story on the idea list? I've got an idea list of stories. LJ? L- LJ. 
What's the top idea of the idea list? <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> I have been given the floor, so I'll I'll tell a quick story and then I will get into uh, the actual Branson subject. Branson Haunted House. Branson Haunted House. All right. So this is actually relevant to to cities and good gaming. Um, so for our, I think, 15th wedding anniversary, my wife and I went to Branson, Missouri, because my friend, my uh, parents have a timeshare there, um, which we've been to once, and I believe they have never been to, but I could be mistaken. They might have made it at some point since then. Um, and we went during the off season because it's a timeshare. And there were still lots to do. We went to a butterfly house, which if you've never been to the butterfly house up there, it's gorgeous. Uh, there are like literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of butterflies. Uh, and you can walk amongst them and you're not allowed to, to touch them, but they can land on you. Um, and uh, one of the things we did was we went to a haunted house and uh, wax museum. And there's a big sign you're going into the haunted house area that says, hey, this is high intensity and there are going to be flickering lights. And uh, yeah, so someone saying the butterfly house is amazing. It was the best part was the butterfly house. Um, but the haunted house sign said there'll be flickering lights. There's intense themes. It can be scary. And there will be actors within the haunted house. They will not touch you. You cannot touch them. Uh, and that you're agreeing to this by proceeding past the point of the sign. We thought that's reasonable. We're being warned that there are going to be people jumping out at us, going booga, booga, booga. We should be ready for that. But we shouldn't punch them, right? Which makes perfect sense. Don't grab them. It's all in fun. So we're going through the haunted house and it's reasonably well done. It's got a, a high level of, of special effects. There's, you know, they've got fog machines and squirts of air that go down the back of your neck. Uh, and one section of it that I actually found really creepy was a sanitarium area. And one of the things that you do when you get to the sanitarium is that you see their security booth and you can see various monitors and on the monitors you see yourself and there is a flickering something behind you. But of course, if you turn around, it's only on the monitors, not actually behind you. And no one jumped out at us and we're going on and going on and we're like, oh, so they don't they don't have people scattered all throughout this thing. All right, now I can hear myself. So I'm taking my earplugs out for a moment. Uh, there are just people in a few key places waiting to jump out and scare us. So that expectation, that sense of dread kept building and building and building as we're dealing with ghouls and, and mechanical things flying at us and all sorts of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> it came to a point where uh, my wife had worked herself up so much. I mean, the haunted house was good, but it was not that good. But she started to huddle behind me and clutch onto my shoulder and push me forward into each room, go into there, see if that's okay. And she's laughing, right? She's laughing at her own behavior, but she's expecting someone to leap out at any second and scream at her. She doesn't think we're in actual danger, right? She would, she, she should have my back in a real sense in that case. She just doesn't want to be the person that comes face to face with Freddy Krueger or whatever. And we are just convinced that the total cacophony of a million people leaping out and screaming at us has got to be right around the corner. And even I am feeling my heart beat pretty hard. And we're just really expecting this, this huge finale. And then we're done. We're out. We walk into the lobby. And we're like, no one, no one leapt out. No one ever came and scared us. And there was one nice ticket taker lady there. And she was like, oh, no, not during the off season. We don't have any actors in the off season. The sign's just there all the time. We were like. Um, and they lost Owen just as I was finishing the story. Da, 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 da. Let me know when you can hear me. Let me know when you can hear me. I'm talking to them, not you, LJ. Ah, apparently I'm back. All right. So, uh, I don't know how far into the story I was getting, so I'll just pick up towards <laughs> the very end. Uh, and I just heard Troy laugh, so I can hear him just a little bit. All right, I hear Troy. I hear Troy. Great. Um, yes. So there was all this expectation, all this buildup, all this this real readiness for people to jump out and get us. And we were more and more and more convinced the further we get through this haunted house that we are about to be leapt upon. Uh, and then we turn the corner and 
all right, Stan says I already told that part. We only have actors during the, the on season. Um, so the most frightening part of this whole experience, which was was the fear of the unknown. No matter what we saw, no matter what we heard, no matter what props and video tricks and sprays of air there were, those could creep us out a little bit. But the only thing that could really get our heart racing was, oh my goodness, is this the moment where the actors are going to jump out and and scare the heck out of us? Um, and that that made us laugh ourselves silly, but it also really elevated the total experience because we had an experience that the actual planned haunted house could not have given us. And it is often like that uh, in role-playing games, that a role-playing game and a, a haunted house are related in some ways, is that you know that this is a pretend experience and it's really hard for anything real anything that is codifiable that you can point at, right? No matter how creepy the picture is, no matter how great Rob Schwab has done describing the horrors of some creature, no matter how good the die rolls is, those are all things that we can codify and count and analyze. And it, it helps us stay in the, in the imaginary part of our brain. But when a GM is talking about, you know, there's a, a, a door and you hear heavy breathing behind it and there's a big padlock on it, there's some stains around the outside and you don't know what's behind that door, that lack of knowledge can have that same kind of experience uh, in, an, in an RPG session, even sitting around a table. Uh, and I think we can, in fact, apply that. I, I always try to apply my stories uh, Brian F. Irving says, if you've seen the film Cube, uh, it's the bits where the parties are not triggering traps that build the tension. Each time it goes off, it sort of releases the tension. Yeah, that's a very good example. Yeah, um, that Cube, that's a very, very good uh, series. Like, there's, there's a few, isn't there? Uh, there are like three or four Cube movies, but the, the first one is the best. And I Agreed. can just barely hear Troy in the background. Well, isn't um, that great? Well, that's a little better. OK, uh, so like if if you're building a city, right, one of the things that you should be thinking about for city uh, adventuring in a role playing game is what is behind, under the surface and what will be the hints to the players that these things exist without just telling them it's out there. Right. Um, so if you go around a a real world neighborhood um, you can sometimes tell something about the neighborhood just by observing it. And those are the sort of clues that you can give someone when talking about areas that allows them to wonder what's going on and help their imagination fill in some of the gaps. And that can be a lot more fun than just telling them, hey, this is the rundown part of town, right? If you say, well, you're, you, you cross over the canal uh, on a, a bridge and there's a guard standing on the side that you were just on with all the merchants uh, and the buildings here tend to be a lot more wood and a lot less stone, but you do notice that they've got big, strong wooden shutters with iron locks are, are on all of these buildings. Um, or all of them have a peephole that you hadn't seen previously in the side. Or even they're, they're crammed very closely together and there are narrow spaces you're not sure that you could easily get through and there are tents over it and there are the sound of, of scuttling and scurrying in, in constant back alleys. That can let the players paint a picture for themselves based on the hints that you are giving them. And that anticipation can drive the whole this is a city experience a great deal more than just telling them, hey, you're in the merchant district and across Ren, the, the canal is poor town. And Ren asks a good question. Uh, who was the writer who said if you set off a bomb in a crowded room, you get a moment to fear. But if you tell the audience that a bomb will go off in 10 minutes, you get 10 minutes of dread. Yeah, I don't know who said that, but I have heard it before. Yeah, it's the same basic idea. Um, and you can play with that in a, a fantasy adventure kind of scenario. Uh, you've got the sort of thing where, for example, if something has been happening every full moon, right, and the, the heroes come into town and they're told, yeah, we had a full moon four or five days ago, and every full moon... Uh, five people are killed and uh, one one building is burned to the ground. Well, then the players have a ticking clock now and they know that something's going to happen to the full moon, right? If it's happened four or five full moons in a row, you expect it's going to happen again. And they can't just say, oh, that's obviously a werewolf because why would werewolves burn a building to the ground? Um, and that puts them in the place where they can begin to try and figure out what's going on. It can be really, really hard to do a mystery uh, in a role-playing game that is not built around a mystery. Now we've got some things uh, like social stunts and and just doing tests and and things like that. 
uh, in Fantasy Age that can help you do that. But one of the ways you can get the feel of a mystery without necessarily having to get people to put together clues and such is to just have a timeline of when things will become clear uh, to the players. One of the things I've noticed in a lot of noir detective hard-boiled fiction stories is that frequently just asking questions doesn't get our hard-boiled detective any answers but it does make people nervous enough that they jump him and thug him and if he defeats them in combat he can then find out who is trying to stop him and that can tell him what's going on so stan has suggested pyromaniac werewolves uh, <laughs> okay yeah i mean py pyromaniac werewolves is absolutely an option and maybe you know, maybe there is, but you could go the other direction, right? Maybe there is a series of werewolves in town who are protecting the town and there is a maddened werewolf hunter or even just wolf hunter that wants to destroy them and he knows they want to protect the town. So the the evil, vile werewolf hunter who's trying to weaken the town by destroying its defenders, he sets a fire to a major building during the full moon, because during the full moon, he knows that the werewolves will be able to come out and that is him baiting them. So the werewolves become the good guys in that version. And the, the evil guy that has wolf traps everywhere and wolves bane hanging off of him and is willing to set fire to buildings and kill the innocent just so that he can defeat werewolves because they're werewolves, even if they're not doing any harm, uh, that could become your villain. And you can pet that on the, the timeline of events, right? Uh, at some point he's going to show up and he's going to try and and trick the the players into drinking wolves bane to see if they're werewolves uh, or he might prick them with silver um you can uh have people find out that that wolves have you know wolves helped uh, a kid come home that can happen during and so these clues just occur and the yeah, the fire department are all lycanthropes says Stan. Uh so the only time that buildings burn down is the night of the full moon. Um or maybe during the night of the full moon, uh, that's that's the one it's least likely to happen, but that's why he's hunting them by setting those fires. Anyway, uh, this is the sort of thing where having something that's unknown and having, as the GM, prepared a timeline of what's going to happen. Um, that can also be a way to have things keep going that can draw player interest in if they're not interested immediately. Like if you note, okay, there are two major underworld factions in this town right the the bunny centaurs run all of the black market hallucinogenic shrooms and they are in near constant state of not quite war uh with the stiltmen guild who normally are are doing other narcotics and stills but they don't do the shrooms ren i see and you the by the way that's brilliant <laughs> uh and, and you set that up, and if the players aren't interested, if you have created this timeline of urban events, then you can say, okay, uh, a couple of bunny people were were kicked by stilt people, and no one's sure who's responsible for that, uh, and then someone's house gets burned down, and then there's a small riot. And these are how things proceed if the players don't get involved, which means that you can just tell them, hey, you wake up, I, I know you all were not interested in this, and you're going and you were delving in the dungeon and looking for the, the secret palace of the were-rat nobles uh, below the, the aquarium area. But you should know that uh, your inn is now going to be charging twice as much money because they are hiring guards because there was an actual small riot last night. Uh, between the the bunny centaurs and the stilt walking guild and that will will allow the players to decide are they going to jump on or not but it also lets them know if you don't get involved in events that doesn't mean they're frozen in time right this is not a a video game where there's a guy with a question mark over his head offering you a quest or i guess an exclamation point uh and he will be uh, quest this bang. Is urgent and what well we call it quest bang yeah, a quest bang, exactly that. Uh, in in a lot of, of online games and computer games, that quest bang is going to stay there. Even if he says it's really urgent, we only have a limited amount of time. If you you know put down your game and, and don't come back to it three months later and you've done 27 other quests, it's still there and it's still urgent. So that gentle <laughs> timeline of events is another way to let people know that this is a world where things are happening with or without you. And you don't want it to go straight to, oh, the entire town was burned down because you didn't leap into the immediately uh the, the first plot hook but they do get the idea of hey things are getting worse things are getting worse stan getting says worse. uh you should know that the bunny centaurs are tripping balls <laughs> <laughs> do we really um, need to know that yeah i mean there are you know depending on what those hallucinogenic shrooms do it it might be that they've had to switch 
<laughs> Brian Irving said, good grief. Joy's voice came and it was so loud that both the cat and I jumped. Sorry. <laughs> we Sorry. Not, we were not trying to do jump scares here on Thursday. No, we're no. I mean, I am kind of, but that's just a everyday a thing for me. It's not necessarily <laughs> by design. Troy, Troy jump scare Hewitt. Is that what you're doing? That's what they call me. Old Troy jump scare Hewitt. <laughs> I don't think anyone calls you that. And they do not. No. Calls, no. Yeah. That, no. That they do really not. Super unlikely. Uh, hey, a question um, for you. So, yeah. so as you're as you're working, um, you know, you're you're building your mystery and you're, you know, choosing so carefully. Um, you know, you're holding it in, holding it on. You know, whatever the lyrics of the rest of that song is. Um, where are you? Where would you suggest people go? Because you just sort of had this encyclopedia. Uh, of odd creatures and, you know, sort of off the cuff, um, you know, uh, bestiaries, you know, like who knows what's going on in there. Um, where do people go when they don't have access to your noggin? Like what kind of resources do we have that they can pick up? Well, first of all, there is the fantasy age bestiary, um, which has a, a bunch of critters in it. Um, and it's, it's, uh, the PDF is available, uh, on our website. I, not sure and you might find it in stores i don't know if it's still in in uh, the distribution chain but you can certainly buy the pdf and it gives stats for a whole lot of creatures in it um as for things like bunny centaurs and and werewolf firemen and stilt walking guilds um, or flare wolves if you will yeah flare wolves that's great um a lot of that just yeah i i see that flare wolves was suggested yes um a lot of that stuff comes out of my head just because I will allow any two elements to filter to the top and then I, I smoosh them together where they, they seem to make any sense or not. And then I try and make them make sense. Uh, and the reason I frequently do things that way, and I do it with everything, with monsters, with, with city building, uh, with nationalities, um, real life is weird. Mm. And real world mythology is weirder. -er. I mean... We all accept things like the Chimera because they are classic creatures mm -hmm. from mythology. But when you think about it saying, hey, here's a thing with three heads and the three heads are from three different animals and maybe and maybe it can't fly and maybe one of the heads is the tail and maybe one of the heads is up front, depending on what version of, of Chimera you're looking at. Ooh, and maybe it's but it's its other head. Yeah, well, I mean, like one of the classic chimeras, right, is a lion with a, a serpent for a tail. So the serpent's head is at the tip of its tail and just a spare goat heads sticking up out of the middle as you do um, that 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 is one of the classic chimera setups and that makes no sense but because that's part of our collective zeit geek we have all simply come <gasps> to accept that multi-headed hybrid creatures chimera creatures griffins hippogriffs whatever uh, are part of the fantasy world but once you've made that jump it is not difficult to say hey uh, here there is a race of two-headed giants, but one of the heads is always an animal head. So there's a giant with a, a human head and a dog head. And here's another one with a human head, but his other head is an eagle head. And here's one with a human head and a fish head, and he can swim through the water. I have a quick and question. Not... Zeitgeek? Yeah. Zeitgeek, was that you? Did you just make that up, or is that a thing that's been out in the Zeitgeek? Uh, I, I have used the term Zeitgeek for a number of years. To the best of my knowledge, I came up with it. I uh, want but... to, yeah. We need clothing, I think. Uh, but there may well, you know, the, the Zeitgeek being what it is, other people may have come up with the Zeitgeek independently. So I'm I'm not claiming that no one can have thought of it unless I used it. But I love it. Yeah, I love it. To the best of my knowledge, I coined that. The um, only the, the best word I've made up is hog donker. And I don't think that applies in this game. Uh, I think the best word I ever made up was spunt hole. Oh, because it doesn't mean anything, but it is clearly rude as heck. It, yeah, it's got a that's got a bad mouth feel. Yeah, it does. It's it's got that edge to it. It does uh, indeed. It's something I would not say in a crowded bar with bikers around. For <laughs> right. just, just for any reason. Word to the wise advice always pig slapper. Yes, I like that. Uh, uh, as you are listening, friends, um, give us your um, not swear word, uh, rude, not rude rudeness. Um, uh, you know, as hog donker, I think it's pretty evocative. You kind of get a sense of what's going on there. Um, and what was yours again? Spunt hole? Spunt hole. Spunt hole. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right up there with flea bling. Um, Jonesy uh, did us a solid and dropped the Fantasy Age Bestiary um, uh, link to the Green Running store. So check that out. Frack is also good. Farnibble. 
FERP. FERP sounds um, like kind of something, a digestive thing. FERP does sound like a digestive, or, or a, a, a nickname for someone. It was my friend FERP. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I like that. So the bestiary isn't going to have things like those two-headed giants that I was talking about, um, but it does have giants, and it does have things with multiple heads. So one of the things I think can be a very useful skill for a GM is to learn how to sort of kit bash and reskin monsters. Um, <laughs> someone suggested water fairies for for the fire brigade. Uh, <laughs> I like so it. if you want to have a a critter that does not exist in the bestiary, you can just pick something similar. If there's some ability that you feel like it should or shouldn't have based on how you changed it, uh, like you could take an ogre and then you can say, okay, well, it can do a swift attack for one less stunt point because it's got this animal head that can bite. And then all the rest of that is just flavor, right? Um, if you want to say it breathes underwater, you just say it breathes underwater. A, a lot of people get very much into not knowing, I'm not sure if it's balanced and I don't know if this is reasonable and how do I, how do I make something able to breathe water? But one of the great joys of tabletop role-playing games is that this stuff does not have to be machine readable, right? Right. So even if there is a specific ability out there that we've created call aquatic or amphibious or whatever that lets you breathe underwater, uh, you can, as a GM, just say it breathes underwater. It breathes underwater. That's it how it's, it yeah. Swim up to a certain speed and it's two headed. And since the other head is a fish head, I don't think it's going to have a bite attack and I'm just going to use ogre stats for it. I have a nibble. The trick there is that the players don't know you're just using an ogre. So they have no idea, is this two-headed ogre, one of which is is a fish head that, that is swimming through the lakes and attacking people uh, on Bridgetown, right? They have no clue what that is. So you get the whole effect of, we're not sure how to deal with it. We don't know what its weaknesses are. We don't know if it's sentient and sapient. Should we negotiate with it? Uh, even though all you've done is slap the ability to swim and breathe underwater and a new description on the ogre from the bestiary. So I like doing that a lot. It's fast, it's easy. Uh, and if you only make small changes like that, it's it's going to be close enough to being balanced, right? Fantasy Age does not, you know, we've got minor threats and moderate threats and major threats. And yes, there are ranges for those things. But if something should be a minor threat, but you gave it one too many special abilities because it has a scream attack that can frighten people if it spends a certain number of stunt points, and it's a little too much, that just means you bumped it from a, a minor threat to a moderate threat or from a moderate to a major. And once the, the players either deal with it or run away, you can learn from that for this group of players, for these characters, that turned out to be too much or not enough. Um, I like sometimes throwing weak things at players so that they know that they don't live in a world where every encounter is perfectly balanced for their exact mix of levels and abilities. Uh, uh, like, I have a, you know, if oh, you're playing great mighty heroes and bandits jump out and, and try and take them for all they're worth, those bandits might just be minor threat bandits that just picked the wrong people to jump out on. You know, I wonder if anyone has ever created like a dance bandit, like they come out and they just sort of, dance at you furiously until you give them all your gold I um sure, I, what arm bandits are a thing so i'm positive oh sure yeah yeah that's true um you know i wanted oh you know brian you bring uh brian says i was just making a point about uh weak opponents uh the other day uh something else i was gonna ask just in general is when it comes to populating your world um where you know this is directed to the um to the uh, honey buns and the oddest, the, the the pig slappers, the furps, if you will. Um, where do you go, or how do you, do you you know kind of create your own stuff? Do you amalgam? Is it amalgam uh, of various pieces that you borrow of you know things that are particularly fun or tricky or you know? I, I, I'm curious. I'm I'm learning, and I, I definitely enjoy kind of seeing where people get their inspiration. Um, so share with us if you will, um, regardless of where it comes from, even if it comes from the dark recesses of your brain. Um, yes, dance up, bro. You and me dance off is a four point stunt. I like that. Dance you just keep absolutely a four point stunt, yeah. keep dancing at them and they just sort of go, Oh no. And then, you know, they run away. You having won the final dance battle. Uh, I like it. Um, how would you defend against a dance attack? Uh, 
probably some sort of morale test. I would, I mean, I'd pick something, right? It's you just pick a thing. This right, man unflappable. Can't this stat this for a for a special ability for a dance off. I like it. And I'm looking through it, and I want to know what all the focuses are. And the reason I want to know what all the focuses are is I don't want to forget one, because even when I know most of this stuff, right? Uh, I don't want to forget something obvious, but here I've got what the abilities are. Uh, and I'm probably not going to resist it with accuracy. Communication's a possibility, not con, not dex, not fighting. Intelligence, maybe perception, probably not strength. And then we've got willpower, which encompasses mental toughness, discipline, and confidence. So if I'm resisting it as opposed to trying to win at it, right? I'm trying to just not get involved with an answer off at all, then I'm going to make that a willpower test. That's just who I am. And when I look at willpower, I see that willpower has as focuses, courage, faith, morale, and self-discipline. So if I'm trying to resist, uh, it's not frightening me. So morale probably isn't appropriate. Uh, courage probably isn't appropriate. Uh, unless I have a God of stoicism, faith probably isn't what I need, but self-discipline seems perfect, right? This is a, a magic that is trying to cause you to be fun and dance around and have a good time. And you have the self-discipline to resist. So I would say, okay, that is a, a test for willpower with the self-discipline focus. And one of the reasons that I like to go to what we've already got here in the book is that when I create special abilities like that, I don't want to say, hey, I'm creating a new willpower focus called uh, stick in the mud. And if you have stick in the mud, you can use it to resist having fun. And the reason I don't want to do that is, first of all, the game is already balanced with a certain number of focuses. So the more I expend expand the number of focuses in the game, the harder it is for people to cover a decent percentage of them. But also this is the book, or when we have it out, the core rule book will be the book that the players have to tell them what is out there? What are my options? What do I what do I get to pick from to define my character? And so if someone was looking at this and they said, well, I want to be really good at being able to control my own choices and not being suckered in things and, and to be able to force myself to study, self-discipline is sort of the self-descriptive ability to do that. And so I would want to base any new abilities on focuses that we already have so that we are working with the system that we've got. Um, and you can do the same thing when you are trying to think of things to add to your city, right? You can literally go through the list of focuses and, and abilities and say, hey, what would interact with this within this city if you want to, right? You can just pick one at, totally at random. Um, I'm going to say fighting. And fighting has axes, bludgeons, heavy blades, lances, polearms, and spears. Those are all specific weapons. But then you can say, well, does this city have some specialist set of fighters? Is there something it's famous for? Is there some group here that is well known? Uh, and so you look at bludgeons. Well, bludgeons is a nice broad category. People don't take bludgeons very seriously. You know, maybe there's a cudgel gang in town. And so you've just decided everyone in the cudgel gang, I will just take regular bandit write-ups, but I will make sure to give them focus with bludgeoning attacks. And so we can do that going to the bestiary or going to just any other adventure. We've got some things in the back of the, the basic rule book. Pick anyone, right? Be it a bandit or an archer or whatever, and just say, okay, because these are part of the cudgel gang, I'm going to give them uh, a focus with fighting bludgeons. And that makes them this special thing that is part of this city. And that all spawned from just looking at the focuses and seeing how the rules define the world and what can I put in the world that is well-defined by those rules. I love it. I love it. Um, you remain unflapped. Um, let's see. We already done. Let's see. Duel. We already did it in one of the settings I plan to put out in the age creators lands. Nice wasteland full of theaters, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be insufferable. Um, let's see. Uh, I have made sure that orcs in my setting consider a dance off to be a legitimate form of duel. Did you really do that, Ren? Is that true? I mean, you've got you've got flighting in in uh, the Norse tradition, right? The the Scandinavian people would get into an insult contest, and you could you could win. A, a minor conflict between people by being better at at calling them out. Um, so there's absolutely a lot of cultures that have traditions of being able to default to some cultural ability or some physical ability 
be that, you know, we're going to settle this with arm wrestling or with an insult contest or even with a dance off those those all you have to do is say, hey, this culture has this as a respected, important part of the culture. And then you can naturally grow to uh, incorporate that into adventures and characters. And again, look at what focuses apply. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and you know, and us, I'm like, I'm actually going to adopt that now, um, which is difficult for me because I am, you know, as they say, uh, disembodied. So. Yeah. Well, you'd have to do the disembodied dance. Yeah. I'm doing one now. Uh, you, you can dance if you want to, you can leave your body behind, but if your body don't dance, if it don't dance then it's no body, then it's of mine. no body of mine. Yeah. Yeah, that is so wise, wise words. I'm going to write that down. I feel a song coming. I just am not quite sure. I got to work on it for a minute. Um, so we are, um, we have done a lot of fascinating things. It's like uh, 2.43, so we're doing good on time. We're still talking about a lot of good stuff. Um, I am curious from um, both the perspective of people who are uh, listening and, and from you, Owen, when it comes to um like when you have uh when you've used a, a character or a type of character like you see like the stilt walkers or the you know the screamer the screamo screamies um uh do you have you taken any of those those sort of templates and then kind of grown them into a larger mythology or a larger sort of play a bigger role in a particular I, i'd love to hear that story Absolutely. Um, I, I do it all the time. In fact, often based on player interest, uh, I added to a campaign a long, long time ago uh, that there was a charcoal burners guild, which were literally people that went out into the woods and burned wood and made charcoal and that they were considered uh, one of the oldest and most powerful and wealthiest guilds. And they had a lot of political links and people thought they kept secrets. And at first that's all it was. There's just a charcoal burners guild, but in, you know, at the same time I was talking about, there's a smithing guild and there's a lamplighters guild and there's a, a canal pole pushers guild, but the players hooked on the charcoal burners guild because burning charcoal did not seem to them like a thing that was likely to make you wealthy and powerful. So that then begins to build as they ask questions and you say, well, you know, a lot of, of castles need charcoal. A lot of forging processes need charcoal. Uh, because they you know the secret of making the best and most efficient charcoal. They've got specialty charcoals. They will sign contracts with nobles not to use any charcoal but theirs. Then they've got a monopoly. Uh, third sons from nobles frequently go to the Charcoal Burners Guild, so it's got family contacts. But players kept digging and kept being interested. And that turned into uh, the Charcoal Burners Guild is a secret order of psychics who are hiding their powers, who have pyrotechnic abilities that they all claim are just various things that they've learned to do with oil and charcoal and naphtha and such. Um, and so there was this whole underworld conspiracy that all just grew out of one role that I threw out there that the players were really interested in and started digging into. And then I had players who wanted to play charcoal burners and then the rules got fully written up. And that is how just a minor thing. I, I don't want to flesh out that level of detail for every guild I ever mention if no one cares, but if you start with some surface level stuff, you know, here's, here's a, a, a tavern in town. Uh, it's got a, a giant, like 30 foot long spear holding up the main room of it. And there's a rule that if you slap yourself in the forehead, you get one silver off your drink. And then people are like, well, why is all of that? And you can right. start with, well, no one really remembers. That's just the way it works. And if the players drop it, you just drop it. It's just local color. There's, there's yeah. an actual place uh, in Alaska where you can drink a shot that has a human mummified toe in it. Oh yeah. Weird that, things yeah. just show up in the world. But then if the players are like, I really want to hunt down, you know, find the, the old storyteller that knows why does slapping yourself in the forehead, give you this bonus. And then you can build a bigger, broader mythology out of that and discover that, you know, this is the place commemorating where they signed the treaty between the Titans and the brain eaters and that you had to slap yourself in the forehead to prove that you didn't have a little slug there. Um, and that, that grows into a broader mythology that no one would have cared about if you'd said, Hey, there's a plaque on the wall that says, this is where this, this happened. And there's a big long history and there's a rundown. And there are five pages of background for people to read. Um, I find it much easier to just put and it's a good idea if I've got some idea what I'm doing, although I am myself reasonably good at just making up BS off the cuff and spinning it out into something. Yeah, that it's one of my favorite things. Um, but uh, 
all I need to start with is a, a few little interesting notes that are non-standard. And that can have a lot of uses. Having, you know, if if the long spear is the name of that tavern, it's the long spear tavern, it's the one with a 30 foot long spear holding up the great hall. Um, players probably won't remember Mortimer's House of Spirits and Gruel just because it's a long, weird name that does not connect to anything. But in my experience, if it's just the Long Spear Tavern and the Long Spear Tavern literally has a long spear in it, they will remember the name of the Long Spear Tavern. Or if they don't remember the name, they'll remember, you know, that place that has the javelin up in the rafters. Um, it gives you something to hook onto. It makes it different from the Wandering Monster Inn and the the prancing one-legged unicorn and, and uh, the the drowning drowning mermaid you can just throw fantasy names out there but if they're not connected to anything you know players are watching shows on netflix and they're playing other games and they're writing their own stuff and they're they're reading memes so all of that can just become word salad but then if right. you hook it to just a couple of details that they can interact with that makes it much easier for them to come up with those things and it makes it seem more real on top of being a possible building off point for yet more interesting stuff I love it, especially if you're working in theater of the mind, less of a, you know, sort of a space where people are like, Wait, hey, what, what part of the city was this that the scream? What would you say? The, the prancing one legged unicorn? Yeah. Old hopscotch, we called them. Um, yeah, let's... absolutely. See, now you're doing it. And they've got a drink called the hopscotch, which is just scotch with some extra hops in it. Okay, so I'm trying to get that. What happens if you take your robot cell phone away? They become a no droid. Okay, I'm... I'm trying to find the the joke there, but I do love um, a good joke uh, for sure. Um, okay, well, I love that. And, um, uh, you know, f have you been able to incorporate like, um, you know, we, we talked a bit about the, you know, me being the, the jump scare, um, you know, of, of this particular broadcast. When, um, when you're thinking of like your reoccurring or returning villains or, you know, sort of the, you know, if they're part of like this a gang or a guild or something and you deal with the, you know, sort of this, these reoccurring characters who are out, you know, uh, what did you say? Uh, smuggling charcoal and such. Um, uh, have you like, how often have you taken the thing that you've created and because it was so great, you, you I mean, because it works so well, you moved it into, um, you know, other, other storylines or other plots or other games that you were playing with other people. Um, are there those oh, kinds the of moments? Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Um, anything that is cool and pop. So there's a concept of something being fungible. And fungible means that it has a value in and of itself disconnected from the units around it. So you can lift it up and put it someplace else and it still has value. That's being fungible. Yeah. Um, like gold is fungible, right? Gold has a value that, that is recognized in and of the gold. Um, there are ideas and pieces and things that are fungible, that are, are easily removed and moved around and, and you can bolt to other things. Um, I think for 20 years now, it has been relatively common in my campaigns to discover that the most alcoholic, worst tasting drink uh, in any given city is Black Dog Black, which is just a thing called Black made by a brewer called Black Dog. Mm -hmm. So people people that I've been playing with for 30 years will remember that there's a thing called black dog black. It just rolls off the tongue for them. And sometimes that's all there is to it. And sometimes black dog black is part of some sort of plot. And sometimes it's the favorite drink of an enemy. Uh, and sometimes it's really rare. So you can literally track an enemy down by trying to figure out are there any shipments of black dog black into the city because he insists on drinking them. You can it's use great. the same thing in lots of different ways, but I pick stuff up and reconnect them and move them all the time if it's something that players have shown ongoing interest in. That's great. That's I, I, I love uh, that idea of people sitting around a table and getting the sort of surprised and delighted by, you know, something that they were passionate about that they continue to kind of follow the trail or made, you know, some interest in, and, and you were able to kind of weave that back in much like uh, David body was saying, I ran a supers game where the players got sidetracked by running into two mob factions, meeting to exchange a burial stone. They just couldn't let it go. I mean, that, that happens yeah. sometimes. I mean, that's almost like there's something really uh, almost coveted about that moment, right? Like, you know, when players significantly take a, a scent and really run with it. Uh, the players being interested in a thing is a gift to a game master. Yeah. Take that gift and build a, build a big bacon adventure cake for them because you already know that's a flavor they want. That's right. Take them into the adventure hole for an adventure cake. We have art for the adventure hole. We do indeed. I got a tattoo of it. 
I I have a hundred percent believe that you got a tattoo of the adventure hole. I have no doubt whatsoever. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, but that would be funny. Um, I, it I, would. I, I'd be like, hey, you want to see my adventure hole? Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, Brian, it's, Brian, uh, right back after, to things we probably shouldn't discuss on the air. There, truth. Oh, yeah, no, I guess I didn't put that together. Um, that's a big secret. I'm not supposed to tell anybody about it. Uh, fan of trading post in my game, uh, fame for its friendliness and for making the worst cheese ever. Although the goblins seem to love it, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Stan, that was TMI even for Stan. I've crossed some I, lines. I, that was right up there, yeah, on the total amount of information. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, so here we are at the waning moments um, of the of the program. Uh, I'm curious if we can take a look into the future and talk a bit about some of the stuff that's coming up. Um, you know, just in this program. And in life in general, um, we've got, uh, for instance, um, we'll have some digital Gen Con presence and yep, uh, you will, we, uh, we are going to work together to do a thing. I don't know exactly what that will be, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling like we want to do some, you know, Owen advice, like a digital sort of, uh, you know, Thursday hey, with totally Owen. down for Owen's advice column. I don't know I wrong with that at all. It. Love it. Um, uh, we're talking about some Green Ronin panels. We've got a lot of stuff coming up um, in the publishing schedule to talk about. Exciting things there. Um, do I remember, uh, Nicole, if you're if you're hanging out, um, as you often are, uh, but mostly just to catch me say the most inappropriate things, um, Origins, I think, is, the, is right after... Gen Con, um, everything happening, I guess, in December this year, or September, everything rather. Everything is in December this year, yeah. Or September. What did I say? You said what I said, which is December, but... Um, yeah, no, yeah. September. Yeah, September is a big one. So, you know, hey, yeah. if you're or, listening... Or Origins is September 30th through October 3rd this year. That's right, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. I cannot wait for... Human interaction. I'm dying. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I do want to September 16th through 19th. So, yeah, yeah. And we'll have a skeleton crew there. Um, It will be just uh, just skeletons um, uh, hanging out. Uh, They will. Yeah. So we'll have a small a small on site uh, contingent of folks so we can um, uh, meet and greet folks after such a long um, absence uh, in general. Uh, But we'll be doing the digital stuff as well. And uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you are a uh, free a booter, if you are somebody who has run games and uh, would like to do that either digitally, uh, in person, we're, we were kind of taking that uh, down a couple pegs in the in the hierarchy of, uh, of event stuff. Uh, for safety, For we just want to be sure that everything's safe and everybody's healthy and all things are, are all things being equal. We would rather focus on doing more of the digital stuff, but we'll, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the games that you run. Um, but, um, but yeah, we just, it just didn't sit quite right yet. Um, and we'll, uh, and we'll explore that uh, moving forward. Cause now we've got, you know, as, as we get more and more people vaccinated and as it sounds like, you know, perhaps, um, you know, in this particular strain, we're out of the woods. Um, but, um, yeah, lots of stuff going on. So send a note to let's play at green Ronin.com and we will um, set you up with uh, all the information that you need. Um, Owen, how about you? What do you got cooking outside in the, you know, in the world at large? Uh, so my, my publisher, uh, my company that I am the publisher for rogue genius games still currently has a Kickstarter for a Starfinder product. Uh, people can check that out for uh, species reforged. We're very excited about it. We're in our last week of that. Um, and other than that, it's, uh, you know, getting ready for the 4th of July and, uh, trying to catch up on backloads of projects. I love it. Um, yes. Uh, Nicole says genderless skeletons manning the Gen Con booth. So yes, look for they and them. They will be hanging out, um, uh, ready to share green running goodies with you. Um, Yes. So, yeah. So lots of great stuff coming on the 4th of July is, um, I am looking forward to that as well. Um, I am also, you know, I've not really dug into Starfinder stuff. I want to just because I'm just, it, everybody in my proximity has, you know, had some dabbling there. So I should, uh, I should do that for sure. Um, I and mean, obviously I'm a fan of Starfinder since I'm, I'm one of the creators of it. Uh, right, right. but you know, there are, 
There are oh, and Stephen Jones put a link for uh, Starfarer Species Reforged in our, our Facebook. Back in the day, we used to have a Link Thanks Wizard, and I think Jonesy is kind of jumping in there to, you know, Link Wizard for uh, us. But there are so many role playing games at this point that you know, if if there are good ones passing you by, that's fine. Just right now, on this stream, just want to make sure that you're buying Age products. So go out and buy Dragon Age, Fantasy Age. Uh, we've got a Trojan Age supplement, which uh, is out in PDF and oh, uh, well loved by the way. Well loved product. It's it's excellent. It's a well. I all I did was say it was a good idea and and give it a little development pass. It's otherwise uh, the other creators did it. So I I feel no shame in saying it's an awesome book. So I had almost nothing to do with oh, it. Oh well, yeah, very well received for sure. Yeah. Uh, so go check those things out. And uh, if you've got questions or topics you would like us to tackle, make sure that you send those to let's play at greenrunning.com. Indeed, we get uh, together and you can uh, perhaps, perhaps not hear us uh, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Pacific. Hear one or the other of us at any given moment. Well, yeah, or we can hear each other, but we can, you know, whatever. It's all part of the charm. Um, but I do want to encourage people as well to... Um, we are about ready to open the doors on the uh, H Creators Alliance. There's a couple people who were waiting for some final touches on a thing and you know who you are but get it done we're gonna uh we want to do that sh very soon so that people can dive in and have some fun with that lots of great work going on um but um you know people are, are taking their sweet time so uh um that's uh that yeah hurry um but that is that uh i think that that's about it for me uh i want to thank everybody who hangs out and um and listens to us as you can, as you are allowed, or as you are able. And uh, we certainly enjoy it. It's a lot of fun to come hang out with you, um, you know, and, and just talk about all of this good stuff and get creative and and, uh, and really kind of just explore the edges of being a really great uh, storyteller, which I think is no matter what you're playing, um, preferably age stuff, that uh, you just get good at it. And I love it. Oh, and thank you, my friend. Um, have a wonderful rest of your evening, and I will, I'll talk to you, Owen, soon. Honey Buns, we'll see you all next Thursday or Monday. You can join us for Mutants and Masterminds Monday. Starts at 2 p.m. Pacific, and uh, that's Crystal Frazier, Steve Kinson, and myself, uh, occasional guests, and all kinds of good stuff, and uh, next week is going to be a great show. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.